Live from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan and the ILS Anchor Desk, you are watching coverage of the Proton Breeze M launch of the Utilsat W2A satellite. You are looking live at pad 39 at the Baikonur Cosmodrome, Kazakhstan. On the launch pad is the Proton Breeze M rocket with the Utilsat W2A satellite on board. Final preparations underway right now for liftoff in less than 25 minutes. Hello, I'm Marla Weech, and welcome to the first mission of 2009 for International Launch Services. Today marks a significant milestone for ILS. This is the 50th launch of an ILS commercial Proton to date. Thank you for joining us today for this special launch. Launch is set for 10.24 p.m. Baikonur time here in the Eastern Time Zone of North America and at the ILS Anchor Desk on the East Coast. Launch time is set for 12.24 in the afternoon. Our customer, Utilsat, and the satellite builder, Talisalenia, are both located in France where launch time is set for 6.24 in the evening. Joining me in the studio is Michael Thee, ILS Program Director. This is Michael's first launch broadcast here at the Anchor Desk, but not his first launch campaign by any means. Michael has been with ILS for three years and has managed four launch campaigns with two more new campaigns on his schedule in the next five months. He's going to be busy during the broadcast. Michael and I will be monitoring pre-launch activities. Michael will be providing mission and insight update into what's going on at the launch site. Now, Michael, what can you tell us about today's mission? Well, thanks very much, Myla. The mission today is to carry the satellite into space is a fairly standard one. The Proton rocket is a three-stage booster with a four-stage, the upper stage, known as the Breeze M. It will be a little more than nine hours from liftoff to satellite separation, including five burns of the Breeze M upper stage. About a minute after liftoff, the Proton booster will be traveling at greater than Mach 1.5, experiencing maximum dynamic pressure, or what we engineers call max Q. Simply put, this is the point at which the aerodynamic stress on the satellite is maximized. At two minutes into the flight, stage one separation occurs. Depending on the weather conditions, we should actually be able to witness stage one separation. Stage two separation happens almost five and a half minutes into flight. Stage three separation occurs nine minutes and 35 seconds into the flight. And then the Breeze, N, the Breeze M is on its own to carry out the rest of the mission. The Breeze M engine will ignite a total of five times to carry the satellite increasingly higher while lowering the inclination finally releasing it into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. We plan to follow the Proton's progress through conclusion of the first burn of the Breeze M upper stage. That burn is scheduled to be completed nearly 16 minutes into flight. A few minutes after that, the vehicle is scheduled to pass out of range of a receiving station for about 50 minutes. And because we won't be receiving any updates for about an hour, we will conclude our broadcast at that point. Now, we encourage you to check the ILS website, which is www.ilslaunch.com for updates on the progress of the mission throughout the day. Updates are posted as soon as they come in. Now, one person that monitors every phase of the launch campaign is ILS President Frank McKenna. In this video, Frank talks about ILS, its relationship with Khrunichev, and how ILS has evolved into a world leader in the industry. We had our first launch on April 9, 1996 for SES and have continued with many launches since that point in time and we've become a very strong and vibrant force in the marketplace. The LKE venture was originally pioneered by a gentleman by the name of Anatoly Kisilov who was the former director general of Kurnichev as well as Dan Telup, the CEO and chairman of Lockheed Corporation. The vision that they had for bringing the commercial Proton product to the marketplace was phenomenal. Uh, when you think about ILS, one of the things that comes to mind is the, the people that are dedicated and talented in this business 
To make it successful, it requires a significant amount of work, time, and sacrifice, and teamwork with the customers and our partner Krunichev to really perform for our customers and become a success. The people are the differentiator to what makes ILS successful in the launch industry. The relationship with Krunichev is key to the partnership and it's integral to everything that we do. Uh, they are responsible for the design, development, and production and launch of the Proton Launch System, and they integrate very well with the complementary skills that ILS brings to the needs of the customers that are ever-changing and very demanding in the commercial space business. We've pioneered a number of those activities over the last 15 years to create value for those customers for the long haul. Commercial Proton has grown from its initial provision of a competitive alternative to Arion in the early 1990s to become a strong and vibrant force in the marketplace today, shaping the launch industry in many ways. Where others have tried and failed, uh, ILS has succeeded. The ILS Commercial Proton is very well suited to meet the demanding needs of the satellite operators as they meet their customers' needs in the ever-changing world market. Thank you for joining us today for the Proton Breeze M launch of the W2A satellite for Eutelsat of France. This is the first mission of the year for ILS and the 344th Proton launch overall. Today's launch marks a significant milestone for ILS, the 50th Proton launch. Proton ranks among the top launchers in the world, and we're very pleased to celebrate this momentous occasion with our longtime customer, Eutelsat. Eutelsat's W2A satellite was built on the Spacebus 4000 C4 platform by Talis Alenia Space. It will weigh almost six tons at liftoff and is one of the heaviest satellites ILS Proton has launched to date. The satellite will serve Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. It also carries Europe's first S-band payload, which will be commercialized by Solaris Mobile, jointly owned by Eutelsat and SES Astra. Whether you're watching us on television or via the web, in France or in the United States, or if you're with our group watching the Proton live at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. We're very pleased that you've joined us for the 50th Proton launch. As we always say, go Proton, go Breeze M, go W2A. You're looking at a live shot of the rocket on the launch pad. The Proton Breeze M should be lifting off in about 18 minutes from now. Now, Frank talked just a little bit about the Proton and its long history, but we'd like Michael to please tell us a little more about the background of the Proton rocket. I'd be glad to, Marla. The Proton is the largest Russian launch vehicle in operational service. The first mission was in July of 1965, and the first commercial Proton launch was in April of 1996 with the Astra 1F satellite. Khrunichev manufactures both the Proton rocket and the Breeze M upper stage. Khrunichev also manufactured the earliest Russian cruise and ballistic missiles, including the UR series ICBMs. The, first, the vehicle's first three payloads were spacecraft called Proton, and in the Russian tradition, the launcher adopted the same name. The Proton has been used solely for launching spacecraft ever since. Proton is used to launch all Russian geostationary and interplanetary missions, and the federal missions are managed by Khrunichev, while International Launch Services offers the Proton for commercial satellite launches. There are about six to seven commercial missions a year. Since Khrunichev purchased the majority ownership of ILS last year, it has an even greater interest in ensuring the commercial success of the vehicle. Well, ILS always produces a poster, a launch poster, commemorate each launch, and these are some of the posters involving our customer, Utilsat. The W3A launch in 2004, the Hotbird 8 in 2006, and, of course, today's 50th ILS launch of the W2A satellite. The W2A satellite is the 27th satellite in Utilsat's fleet. The launch posters are custom-designed for each mission, and they reflect the unique features of the satellite and the customer, as well as the cultural significance of the countries or continents that would benefit from the satellite's coverage. They really look great. For a complete look at the poster for each launch, log on to www.ilslaunch.com. 
Again, the launch is scheduled at 1024 p.m. Baikonur time, and that is about 15 minutes and 53 seconds from now. Before that, however, we are going to go live to Paris, France for a comment from Eutelsat CEO Giuliano Beretta. Eutelsat is Europe's largest satellite operator and the third largest globally. Eutelsat is a key satellite player for video broadcasting, telecom, and internet services. So let's go now to Mr. Beretta in Paris, and what can you tell us about the W2A launch? Thank you, Myra. In this period, Eutelsat uh, is always uh, on the launch pad. We've been there in uh, December, in February. We are there again today. So, and this year, we are going to be there again in a few months, uh, and this, this time again with uh, uh, Thales, uh, Alenia Space, uh, like in this case. So, we've been sharing between uh, Astrium, two launches, and two with the Thales Alenia Space. But the Thales Alenia Space are big ones. This is a 5.9 tons, is the largest satellite we have never been launching. There is uh, an antenna with 12 meters to be deployed. We never did anything of this type. And uh, as I was saying before, it is uh, three satellites in one, in fact, because there are three missions. The mission in KU band with up to 46 transponders, depending on the power that each transponder will use. And uh, a mission in KU band, of course, our traditional band. A mission in C band for Africa. We're going to build in uh, Madeira uh, facilities for that, uh, and in Sardinia, is an island mission to go to Africa. And uh, finally, the S-Band mission, that will uh, be uh, a mission for several purposes, uh, such as uh, infomobility, for cars, for television on the mobile, to complement uh, the system uh, that they will be in the future. We hope to get, uh, obviously, we hope very strongly to get uh, the frequency in the 28 states of the European Union and we think we should be the one to get it, and uh, from the European Commission. And uh, finally, it is a, a mission that is complex with this interleave of different missions. I think uh, that uh, we are going to be here for several hours waiting for the conclusion of this, uh, of this mission, uh, and uh, in particular, the Proton will have to complete a long journey of nine hours and in the course of this evening, we'll be all there waiting for the conclusion of this uh, great journey in the space, as it was said before. I don't want to speak anymore, because I think that now we have to leave uh, the stage to our launcher. You will have uh, some minutes uh, still to wait until uh, the launch will uh, leave the launch pad, but don't think that is the end of the story. Please remain connected with us, and uh, all together, we touch wood, we touch anything that we need to touch to be successful, <laughs> and uh, let's go for the best. Beautiful. Beautiful. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Beretta. And once again, a live look at the Proton rocket. It is sometimes hard to tell what the weather is like in these pre-launch images, but weather certainly plays an important part in every launch. Michael, it looks pretty good, but how are weather conditions out there right now? Well, Marla, overall the weather conditions at the site are favorable for launch. The Proton is specifically designed to launch in most weather conditions, such as extreme hot or cold conditions. The only weather condition that could cause a delay in the Proton flight is harsh winds. When this campaign it was quite cold in Baikonur, but the arrival of spring has brought much milder temperatures to this cent south central region of Kazakhstan, which is a high desert. Currently, the weather re readings in Baikonur indicate we are within range limits at, for liftoff. Last check, we had temperatures 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, wind speed 2 to 5 meters per second, and a wind direction out of the southwest. So weather conditions are good, and currently we are go for launch. And that means that the launch team is verifying that all the Proton systems are configured properly for launch. They're verifying battery chargers, actuator positions, pro propellant tank pressures, just to name a few. And while the launch team is monitoring the rocket, the payload team is doing their final checkouts on the spacecraft. 
Both payload and launch vehicle teams must commit that they are ready to go before we can launch. We are about 10 minutes and uh, 54 seconds away from liftoff. So, Michael, tell us a little more about the launch site itself in Baikonur. Well, Marla, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan is the oldest and largest operating space center. The facility is operated by Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, and the area is under lease from the Republic of Kazakhstan. And there are two pads available for ILS launches. W2A will launch from pad 39 in area 200 on the western end of the college. Michael, as ILS program director, you've been directly involved in several missions. What is the typical time frame now for an ILS Proton launch in Baikonur? Well, Marla, typically from crew and spacecraft arrival, it takes weeks. There's a great deal of advanced planning, organization, and in particular, a lot of teamwork when you consider that it usually takes two years for the launch vehicle and the satellite to be built tested and shipped to the launch site. The W2A campaign started in mid-February with the arrival of the early team. And this is the Antonov, the Russian cargo plane that brings the, uh, uh, the spacecraft to Baikonur. It's offloaded onto a train and it takes a very calm, quiet six-hour ride from the airfield out to 92A50, which is our operations building. And once there, the spacecraft is unpacked and it's prepared for mating up to the spacecraft. And right here you see the, the spacecraft being mounted uh, in a vertical position up onto the Breeze M, which is the main, the main engine. And from the vertical position it is rotated horizontally in order to be able to install the payload fairing. And here's the uh, bottom half of the payload fairing. This is the nose cone of the rocket. And the payload fairing is installed in two halves. And this is one of the, this is the top half going in right now. But this is one of the uh, times when cameras are abundant in the, in the uh, operations rooms. The upper stage is then mounted to the, sp to the rocket, 192 odd feet of rocket. And in a horizontal position, the rocket itself is lifted up onto a train car. And at a, exactly 6.30 a.m. every time, which is when Yuri Gagarin rolled out to the launch pad, the rocket is, is rolled to the launch pad, pad 39. It's in a horizontal position. They have a giant erector that brings it up to a, to a vertical position in preparations for it to, uh, to, to launch, to get it in the proper launch position. Well, in addition to that 6.30 a.m. rollout, what are some of the other launch traditions? Well, they have a, uh, uh, at, at the pad they have something which is the blessing of the rocket. This, this, this goes a long way back and, and there's also a rocket signing. The, uh, all parties and team members will sign the, uh, will sign the fairing, as you can see. And uh, they, they're, they're, it's a, a great photo opportunity for all, all, the, all the parties involved. Proudly putting their signature on their product. All right, Michael, thank you. Don't forget, you can get mission updates on our website, www.ilslaunch.com. You will find photographs and descriptions of the mission traditions, the blog, the mission overview, and the latest news release about the mission. Now, from the homepage, click Read More under the current launch, and you will see the mission control page. This is where we will post the status updates when the broadcast is over. The photographs and blog entries posted on the website give a personal glimpse into life at the launch site, and each entry is written by one of the ILS team members on the site. If you live in the United States or Canada, you can also get updates by calling the ILS launch hotline at 1-800-852-4980. Again, that is 1-800-852-4980. Again, let's take another live look at Rocket with liftoff scheduled about six minutes and 54 seconds from now. And let's also take a moment to see what will happen as the Proton carries its satellite payload toward orbit as outlined in this mission profile video. The following profile details the important events of the mission using nominal times. 1.75 seconds before liftoff, stage one engines are ignited and the Proton roars to life. Ten seconds after liftoff, the Proton executes a roll maneuver to align its launch flight azimuth to 71.9 degrees. 62 seconds after liftoff, Proton is traveling about Mach 1.5 and experiencing maximum dynamic pressure. The first stage is equipped with six gimbaled single-chamber liquid propellant RD-276 rocket engines that fire for a little over two minutes 
propelling the vehicle to an altitude of 43 kilometers. The four gimbaled single chamber liquid propellant rocket engines of the second stage ignite three and a half seconds before stage one separation and then burn for approximately three and a half minutes. At this point, about five and a half minutes into flight, stage two separation occurs. Stage three now propels the vehicle for the next four minutes. Payload fairing separation occurs approximately 15 seconds after third stage ignition. About nine minutes and 35 seconds into the flight, stage three separates from the Breeze M upper stage. 11 minutes and 39 seconds into the flight, the Breeze M now ignites for the first time during the mission. This first burn is for about four minutes and 20 seconds, allowing the Breeze M to insert itself and its spacecraft payload into a low Earth elliptical parking orbit of 133 kilometers perigee altitude and 273 kilometers apogee altitude with an inclination of 48 degrees. After reaching parking orbit, the Breeze M and its payload are traveling above the Earth at a speed of about 7,480 meters per second or 16,700 miles per hour. From the parking orbit, the Breeze M will deliver the spacecraft to its target geosynchronous transfer orbit by means of four additional burns that occur over the next nine hours. At approximately 66 minutes into the flight, the Breeze M main engine ignites for the second time, beginning a 17 minute, three second burn and placing itself into an intermediate orbit. Now the perigee altitude is increased to 240 kilometers and the apogee altitude is increased to 5,000 kilometers. After coasting for a little over two hours, the Breeze M main engine ignites again and burns for approximately 11 and a quarter minutes. Less than a minute after the end of burn three, the now depleted auxiliary propellant tank is jettisoned. The Breeze M engine ignites a minute and a half later for its fourth burn. That lasts for about six minutes. This is followed by the longest coasting phase of the mission, which lasts about five hours. In this transfer orbit, the perigee is now at 400 kilometers and the apogee is at 35,627 kilometers above the Earth. The fifth and final time the Breeze M engine ignites is at the apogee of the transfer orbit at about eight hours and 49 and a half minutes into its mission. It then burns for about six minutes and 14 seconds. This is where the orbital unit will maneuver for a big plane change. 14 minutes after this maneuver, the W2A satellite is separated from the Breeze M. At this point, the satellite reaches its target geotransfer orbit of 5,010 kilometers perigee, 35,596 kilometers apogee, and 20.7 degrees inclination. We are now back live at the ILS anchor desk. Michael Fee, ILS program director. The launch is just minutes away. What are the final steps being taken at the launch site? Well, Marla, the launch team is basically completing its final checks and preparations. That includes checking a variety of things, electrical connections, battery interfaces between the rocket and the payload, and a final look at the weather. About 10 minutes ago, the spacecraft signaled that it was ready to go, followed by a similar signal at T minus five from the Proton's first three booster stages. Then at T minus two minutes, the Breeze M upper stage is pulled by the automatic sequencer to give the last go command prior to liftoff at T minus zero. Right now the vehicle appears to be in positive condition for liftoff. Before we listen to the flight's progress from Baikonur, I want to point out to all viewers that now and for the first few minutes after liftoff, we'll be watching the action from Baikonur in real time. As the Proton travels easterly downrange, however, our viewers will notice some time lags between the actual flight and the display of those events and in the commentary. The reason behind this delay is that as Proton follows its pre-programmed flight path, it will pass out of range of the Baikonur receiving stations. At this point, signals are received by stations downrange and transmi transmitted back to Baikonur. This may cause some short delays. Now, as we sit and watch the rocket uh, out in Baikonur, we're at T minus one minute and counting. 
and the different teams are in different areas of the of the Cosmodrome. Certain folks are at the uh, uh, 4102, which we call our control room. Uh, I'm not used to seeing this view because I'm usually down in the in the bunker, which is uh, off to the right of this picture and underground monitoring the launch campaign with the Russian program director, who in this case is Vladimir Bronfman. And there's a lot of crossed fingers. Uh, people that aren't directly associated with the launch campaign right now uh, are sitting out by the hotel. It's dark and it looks clear and it looks like a, a, just a perfect night for a launch. And we're at T-minus 20 seconds in counting. And there's a lot of anxious people waiting for the, uh, for the countdown. And we're at T-minus 10. T minus five, four, three, two, one. And we have liftoff of an ILS proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan carrying the W2A communications satellite. But flight status nominal. So far the status is nominal. The spacecraft is traveling in the easterly direction. About 10 seconds after liftoff, the rocket did a roll maneuver and will soon experience maximum dynamic pressure, or max Q. It corresponds to about Mach 1.5 Mach 1 and occurs about 62 seconds after liftoff. We're at plus 45 seconds and status is nominal. Everything seems to be proceeding as the vehicle heads easterly with a flight azimuth of about 71.9 degrees. We're at 62 seconds and max Q. We'll be coming up shortly on first stage separation from the second stage. And we're fortunate we're going to be able to see it with the clear evening. Everything is nominal. All systems are stable. We're 90 seconds into the launch and still a clear view. And in approximately 109, one minute and 59 seconds, we should be able to see first and second stage separation. One minute 55. Everything is nominal. And there's second stage separation. We have confirmation of first and second stage separation. The second stage engines actually ignite while still attached to the first stage and the exhaust from these engines escape through the open grid work between the two stages. And it looks like we have a signal ignition on all four second stage engines. All is nominal. And the next milestone will be separation or stage two, three separation, which will occur at plus five minutes and 29 seconds. Very good, very beautiful. Thank you, Michael. How exciting. A beautiful 50th ILS Proton launch and a great way to start the year. During the course of the mission, we are going to hear from Jim Bonner and John Palme. Jim Bonner is ILS's Chief Technology Officer and John Palme is ILS's Deputy Vice President of Mission Assurance. Together, they will explain the ILS commitment to quality initiative. So let's first listen to Mr. Jim Bonner. In the spring of 2008, we announced a Khrunichev-led top-to-bottom quality assessment and overhaul called the Quality Initiative. Many of the actions have been completed, enabling us to successfully launch nine Proton missions in the last six months. All of these activities are designed to provide lasting, long-term benefits and our approach to quality for years to come. Some of the key elements of the Quality Initiative include creating new positions, 
at both Krunichev and ILS, establishing a unified Krunichev quality management system across all of its subsidiaries, recertification to the latest international quality standards and continued yearly audits, reevaluation of all factors to improve the launch vehicle design quality, and finally, enhance customer visibility into product and process quality. Let me share with you some of my observations of the impact of the quality initiative. The production team is taking more time when building and verifying compliance with the high quality standards. Krunichev is taking a more conservative approach regarding production and verification processes, in some cases performing retests just to ensure repeatable results. Krunichev is conducting quality days where the shop personnel take time from production, get together and discuss the operations and how they can be improved. With nine successful launches, there were no major anomalies during either pre-flight or in-flight. So where do we go? In 2009, Krunichev will undergo an exhaustive yearly audit of the quality management system. It will certify Krunichev to produce launch vehicle hardware for 2010. Through investments already completed, additional quality software and hardware assets will be brought online to enable the quality team to operate more efficiently. Finally, and maybe most importantly, the quality initiative that is a part of the fabric of producing and launching the Proton vehicle is here to stay and will continue to improve the reliability of launches for our customers. At ILS and Krunichev, our focus is on the job at hand. Whether it is a process at the factory or at the launch site, each launch is important, as is each launch vehicle. We measure our success one launch at a time. And we are now just about six minutes into flight and coming up on some important milestones. Michael, what is the latest now? Well, Marla, we've just gotten word from, uh, from the Baikonur Com Communications Center that we do have confirmation of stage two and stage three separation. And the jettison of the payload fairing has been confirmed. All systems are running nominally, and it it's, it's a perfect launch so far. Beautiful. Very, very good. And while we wait for that next milestone, let's take a look at the corporate video from Utilsat. W2AIM, Utahsat's latest satellite, will accompany the development of resources at 10 degrees east. Delivered by Thalassilinia Space, W2A will replace the W1 satellite at 10 degrees east, where it will have a design lifetime of more than 15 years. 10 degrees east is one of Utahsat's long-standing orbital locations and a key position for data and professional video networks. W2A will more than double the amount of KU band available at this location, while also boosting the fleet's C-band capacity for services across Africa. The satellite will also feature an innovative S-band payload, the first in Europe, enabling delivery of mobile, multimedia broadcast services directly onto user mobile terminals and vehicles. The KU band payload will provide up to 34 transponders connected to an enhanced wide beam footprint serving Europe, North Africa and the Middle East. Up to 15 KU band transponders will be connected to a second beam serving Southern Africa and Indian Ocean Islands and will enable interconnectivity between Africa and Europe. The C-band payload of 10 transponders will provide pan-African coverage, extending to India and parts of Asia, as well as Latin America for broadband and telecommunication services. The S-band resources, targeted over Europe, will open up a new generation of data and mobile TV services, linking satellite and terrestrial networks. In urban areas, widely deployed terrestrial transmitters will take over from satellite for urban canyons and indoor reception. Outside urban areas, mobile terminals and vehicles will be able to directly receive satellite signals with total user transparency. These S-band satellite resources will be commercialized by Solaris Mobile, a joint venture created by Utahsat and SES Astra. W2A, delivering triple band capacity for data and professional video markets, 
and introducing mobile TV services via satellite. Back now live with ILS Program Director, Director Michael Fee. Please bring us up to the minute on the progress of the W2A mission right now. Uh, sure, Marla, I sure will. Uh, as mentioned, we did have payload fairing jettison, and we are approaching the shutdown of stage three from the, uh, uh, from the upper stage. And um, the orbital unit will then, which is the breeze M, is the, up, the, the space, the, I'm sorry, at the moment of separation, the orbital unit will be traveling just over 7,400 meters per second, or more than 16,000 miles per hour. And about one and a half minutes after that, the Breeze M will ignite for its first burn. And that burn will last for almost five minutes. About four minutes later, the vehicle is scheduled to go out of range of our tracking stations. This is where we lose communications for about an hour. And during that time, the Breeze M will coast for about 50 minutes before igniting for its second burn and then shutting down again. And I've just gotten confirmation of third stage shutdown and separation of the orbital unit. So all is nominal. Very good. Thank you, Michael. And now let's hear from the CEO of Solaris Communications, Steve Main. Solaris Mobile is a joint venture between SES Astra and Utilsat. Hello, and welcome to Dublin, headquarters of Solaris Mobile. I would like to congratulate Utilsat and ILS for providing this foundation for the launch of our new business. Today is an exciting day for Europe. After many years of promise, a European satellite is carrying on board a state-of-the-art payload to offer a completely new, powerful and unique network for mobile communications all over Europe. This new network will bring to European consumers TV and other broadband communication services when they are on the move, whether to their phones, their PDAs, or their cars. Solaris Mobile is a joint venture formed in 2006 between Utilsat Communications and SES Astra, two of the world's leading satellite operators. They believed that Europe was ready for next generation mobile communication services, these two major operators decided to combine forces to develop and deliver superior mobile services in a dedicated portion of the frequency band. This spectrum is located next to the 3G mobile frequencies used across Europe. With an investment to date of approximately 150 million euros, our company starts the construction of this new network with the launch today of the W2A satellite aboard a proton launcher. Supported by Solaris Mobile, both existing and a new generation of content providers will be able to offer TV and radio, whether broadcast or downloaded, to mobile phones, PDAs, iPods, portable DVD players, game consoles, and other handsets. And for people in their cars, there will be a range of new entertainment and location-based services to complement their GPS systems. Solaris Mobile is now ready for launch. The W2A satellite will go into operation at its orbital position at 10 degrees east in a few weeks' time. With its satellite payload and growing ground-based network of terrestrial repeaters, Solaris Mobile will be the first player in this brand's new market to provide a unique, powerful network offering broad coverage all over Europe. Thank you for the opportunity of joining you on this exciting day, and goodbye from Dublin. Thank you, Mr. Main. And Michael just tells me just now that the Breeze M is taking over the mission for the next eight hours, so everything continues to go well in this mission. So now let's take a look at a corporate video with details of Solaris Mobile Communications. In 
in early 2009, Europe will benefit from the launch of mobile satellite services. The W2A satellite will carry into space the first S-band payload serving Europe, ordered by Solaris Mobile, a joint venture between Utasat and SES Astra. For the first time in Europe, terrestrial and satellite networks will operate together using a common frequency band in a single network, which will be totally transparent for users. In urban areas, widely deployed terrestrial transmitters will take over from satellites for urban canyons and indoor reception. Outside urban areas, mobile terminals and vehicles will be able to directly receive signals emitted by Solaris's S-band payload. Major industry players are cooperating to create optimal conditions for large-scale European deployment of mobile services that are already showing substantial success elsewhere in the world. Over 16 million Americans now listen to satellite-based S-band digital radio. Just two years after initial broadcasts in Japan, there are nearly 12 million mobile television viewers. 1.6 million new mobile TV handsets are sold in Japan every month. Using a 12-meter S-band antenna, the W2 satellite will operate a substantial volume of new bandwidth, representing 30 MHz on the uplink and 30 MHz on the downlink. This capacity is reserved for mobile satellite services and available in all European countries. In 2007, the DVB consortium agreed the specifications of a new European standard called DVB-SH, which is perfectly complementary to the already validated mobile standard DVB-H, as well as 3G standards for cellular networks. For mobile television viewers, the S-Band will ensure higher quality and wider choice of programs. Smart antennas for portable telephones will optimize reception quality and the newest generation of mobile screens will enable consumers to watch their choice of television programs where and when they want, in the town or in the country, going for a walk, in the car or on a train. Solaris Mobile will open important opportunities for the motor industry. As vehicles become increasingly intelligent, they will also become permanently connected via the return channels the S-Band can provide. On the safety side, with automatically or manually activated emergency alerting systems, it will be possible to advise on the nearest recovery service in the event of a breakdown. Interfaced with Galileo or GPS systems, cars will also be able to automatically pay motorway tolls, while passengers make hotel reservations. Cars will also present invaluable sources of information. For example, it would be possible to monitor traffic flows by collecting travel speeds or pollution indexes from vehicles. On the return link, the spectrum will be used for delivering real-time information. The S-Band will also give authorities a secure communications network that can operate even in extreme conditions for emergency situations. The S-Band offers tremendous development potential for a wide range of sectors. Terminal manufacturers, the automotive industry, network operators from telecommunications to motorways and content providers. The arrival of Solaris Mobile in 2009 will herald the opening of a new space for telecommunications in Europe. Time now for another mission update. Checking back in with Michael Fee. What is happening at this point? Well, thanks, Marla. As, as you mentioned earlier, the Breeze M has now taken over for the next nine hours of the, of the mission, eight and a half to nine hours of the mission, and presently we have received uh, confirmation of our main, main engine startup, and we're waiting for confirmation of the first burn uh, cutoff, which was to happen after four and a half minutes. So uh, everything is operating nominally at this stage. All right, very good. Thank you, Michael. And as Michael indicated, we are at the point in the mission now where Breeze M, or the upper stage, is just getting started. A total of five burns will be required before we get to spacecraft separation. Now let's view the corporate video and message from Reynald Sesnik, CEO of Talos Alenia Space. Let me say how much I appreciate sharing with you this major milestone for W2A. W2A represents a revolution for European satellite mobile communications. Since the 90s, Thales Alenia Space has been UTELSAT industrial partner, and we have had the chance to be regularly challenged in order to support UTELSAT's visionary approach. Once again, 
with a W2A satellite, we have the opportunity to take up a new technological quest. W2A is indeed a real technology breakthrough with a 12 meter S-band antenna, a payload power of about 12 kilowatt, and a mass of six tons. It is one of the most powerful European satellites, boosting Utilsat's KU band and C band capacities. W2A will carry Europe's first S-band payload. And this is a major innovation, paving the way to new services and opportunities. Commercialized by Solaris Mobile, it will be the first European system designed to broadcast video, radio, and data directly to mobiles and vehicle receivers anywhere on land, at sea, and in the air. Utelsat's vision in integrating the S-band frequency opens tremendous new market opportunities. I am delighted that the excellent cooperation set up between our teams culminated in this milestone. Along with the Thales Alenia Space Teams, I would like to congratulate Utelsat, Solaris, and ILS, which is, by the way, celebrating its 50th launch today. At Thales Alenia Space, we are honored to be Utelsat industrial partner and very proud to bring our contribution to this new satellite generation, to be part of this revolution. And back live at the ILS Anchor Desk with ILS Program Director Michael Fee. Michael, update us now on where we are in the mission. Well, Marla, we've just received word from Baikonur that uh, the Breeze M first burn uh, cutoff was, was nominal and right on schedule. So we are moving along as planned. I received word from the launch site that the uh, Breeze M has also moved into its planned blackout period. The vehicle will be currently out of all range of all Russian receiving stations and we aren't scheduled to be back in communications until after the second burn is completed about an hour from now. All right, well now that we are in a planned signal blackout, Let's take a moment to hear more about ILS's commitment to a quality initiative. You heard earlier from ILS Chief Technology Officer Jim Bonner about this initiative. Now let's learn a bit more about it from ILS Deputy Vice President of Mission Assurance, John Palme. Quality first is the mantra at Krunichev, and my role here at ILS is very specifically focused on working with Krunichev to meet that requirement. At ILS, I'm responsible for quality initiative monitoring, launch vehicle, hardware and software configuration management, and overall quality and mission assurance oversight. This requires monthly quality meetings, production reviews, and program management reviews between ILS and Krunichev. ILS has also expanded the scope and breadth of the mission-specific quality sections of the preliminary design and critical design reviews. Additionally, the Launch Vehicle Quality Review has been expanded to provide an exhaustive and comprehensive review and status of Proton Breeze M launch vehicle hardware and software quality prior to the start of each and every launch campaign. ILS considers regular reporting of our progress to be crucial to our quality efforts, and we are committed to providing as much insight and transparency to our customers as possible. In November 2008 and February 2009, we published our first and second Proton Breeze M quarterly quality reports, which provide a summary of launch vehicle hardware at the factory, hardware delivered to the launch site, and launch mission results. We're working hard to continue to improve how we implement and report quality, and we know that each launch is critical both for us and for our customers. Mission success and constant improvement is not just a goal here at ILS, it's a requirement. ILS dedicated to success. Back live now, as mentioned earlier, we are in a planned blackout period, so no new data is expected currently. As we wait, let's take a moment to hear from Bertrand Moncouquet, ILS Program Director for the W-2A mission on what is a successful mission today, the 50th for ILS, the 50th ILS launch of the W-2A satellite, a wonderful event for everyone involved. Bertrand Moncuquet, the ILS program director for W2A. This is my seventh campaign with this impressive Proton M Breeze M launcher, but I'm particularly proud to be here for the 50th ILS launch. As our satellite is on the high range for weight, 
The BREATHEM will use the standard five burns to reach the required injection parameters. And that will take about nine hours and ten minutes from the lift off to the separation. We've had a good and efficient launch campaign, and all the teams here, Utilsat, Thales Alina Space, ILS, Krunichev, and the other Russian partners have worked well together to have this launch on, on the scheduled launch date. The campaign was not a short one, but uh, that gave us the opportunity to see two launch here, and particularly the last ISS mission with three cosmonauts on board, and it was fantastic. Yes, fantastic indeed. All right, Michael, let's give us please a recap and an explanation of what happens to the W-2A satellite once it's released into space. I'd be glad to, Marla. This mission has been progressing very well and as expected. Liftoff occurred at 12.24 p.m. Eastern Time. Separation of Stage 1 and Stage 2 occurred a little more than two minutes into the flight. Stage 2 and 3 separation happened at about five and a half minutes and the payload fairing was jettisoned shortly thereafter. The BREEZEM upper stage separated from the stage three almost 10 minutes into the flight, and then the BREEZEM engine, the BREEZEM engine then ignited for the first time at about 11 minutes and shut down successfully. Following the shutdown, the BREEZEM upper stage carrying the W-2A spacecraft enters a coast period lasting a little less than an hour, during which time the vehicle will enter a circular parking orbit. As mentioned, we are currently in a blackout period where we will not get a signal for another hour or so. The final target orbit is a geosynchronous target orbit with a high point or an apogee of almost 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth at the equator. Ultimately, the satellite will be positioned at its operating spot of 10 degrees east. This is one of the most long-standing locations used for over 20 years. The mission will culminate at mission elapsed time of 9 hours and 7 minutes when the BREEZEM will release the W-2A spacecraft. That will be just after 7.30 a.m. in Baikonur, 9.30 p.m. for the North American viewers, and that will be just after 1.30 a.m. for our viewers in France. Well, Michael, you mentioned the satellite deployment and our viewers in France. One person who's very much attuned to all that's going on right now is Juan Garcia de Marseille. And Juan is the Director of Satellite Procurement for UTELSAT, and here are his comments about today's mission. W2A represents for UTELSAT one of our most ambitious and innovative satellite programs, and it has really uh, required a combination of the highest levels of performance with a very, very tight schedule. It has indeed uh, presented uh, UTELSAT with a new set of technical challenges. Somehow, uh, W2A is like if we had uh, three satellites roll into one with its C-band, uh, KU-band and S-band missions all together. It, is, uh, uh, it has uh, 12 kilowatts of payload power, weighs uh, near six tons at liftoff, and it will be the heaviest uh, satellite of the UTELSAT fleet with a uh, farm of five reflectors which include the S-band 12 meters deployable antenna which is folded like an umbrella inside the frame of the rocket and which will be deployed in orbit uh, about six days after launch. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank all the industrial teams that have contributed to this project, in particular the Thales Alinea Space, ILS and Kronichev teams, as well as our own UTELSAT project team led by Philippe Maton for all the efforts and dedications uh, throughout the program. And I really wish W2A a fully successful mission. Our collaboration with Thales will continue after W2A with the W7 spacecraft, which will be launched this summer and then followed with the uh, W3B program in 2010 and W3C in 2011. Satellite deployment is still nearly nine hours away, and that will be long after we conclude this broadcast. However, as you've heard, the payloads for this mission are unique. Michael, what makes the W2A payload special? Well, Marla, the W-2A is carrying three different payloads. The first is a KU band, which will center over Europe. The second is a C-band with capacity is for telecoms, data, and internet access across Africa. And for the first time, the S-band payload will deliver mobile multimedia broadcast services directly into Europe. That will cover services such as mobile TV and digital radio. 
All right, thank you, Michael, for that summary about W2A. For a bit more about W2A, now we have this statement from Jean-Christophe Chotard, the W2A program director for Talis Alenia Space. This program demonstrates uh, that Talis Alenia Space can overcome tough challenges, such as delivering a spacecraft like W2A in uh, uh, 28 months since mission definition. And uh, this was achieved uh, thanks to the uh, strong dedication of the technical team uh, and the, to the remarkable uh, and continuous uh, commitment from uh, our management. Uh, let me also address my uh, warmest thanks to Utelsat, our customer, uh, with whom a relationship of excellent quality was established and has literally borne this project. Uh, and uh, Utelsat, who was a decisive actor to allow us to be here tonight. Clanda um, Yuz équipe uh, de Thales Alenia Space, de Cannes, Toulouse, uh, Madrid, Rome, Charleroi, uh, mais aussi uh, Aris de Melbourne. Uh, vous avez beaucoup donné sur ce projet, uh, mais vous pouvez être très fiers du résultat. And we are about to conclude this launch broadcast, but no ILS Proton launch broadcast would be complete without hearing from Khrunichev's W2A program manager, Vladimir Bronfman. Let's listen now to a translation of what Dr. Bronfman had to say. Good afternoon. My name is Vladimir Bronfman. I am the W2A Spacecraft Launch Program Director on behalf of the Krunichev Space Center. Our collective, consisting of 35,000 people, has been working really hard for one and a half years to make this launch possible. We have manufactured the hardware and completed all the required tests. Their results satisfy both the international and national standards of the countries participating in this launch. We are very grateful to our customer, the Utilsat, who had entrusted their ambitiously sophisticated satellite to our Proton-M launch vehicle. We are proud of our lasting cooperation with our French colleagues from Thales Alenia Space. And this is our 50th anniversary launch performed in cooperation with the ILS. There's only one last effort left to be made, and we are fully ready to make it. It has been an exciting mission so far, and uh, as we had planned, we are going to wrap up our launch broadcast since no new data will be available for the next hour. And as we do so, I would like to thank our expert, Michael Fee, ILS Program Director, for being with us today and keeping us informed on the mission. Michael, what is next for the ILS missions? Well, as we mentioned, it's going to be a pretty busy year for, uh, for ILS. Our next mission is Protostar 2, and the launch date is tentatively set for mid-May. And uh, this is a launch for Protostar Limited and Indovision, our customer. Very good. All right, and remember, you can stay up to date on the W2A mission and uh, by visiting the ILS website, which is www.ilslaunch.com, or in the U.S. or Canada by calling the ILS Launch Hotline at 1-800-852-4980. Eight zero, and we have seen some exciting things today from Paris, from Baikonur, and uh, from the ILS launch desk. Uh, and so this is a live shot right now, an exciting moment for them in Paris as well. Again, confirmation of spacecraft separation is expected just before 10 p.m. Eastern U.S. time tonight. This concludes our live coverage of the ILS Proton Breeze M vehicle with the W2A spacecraft for Utilsat and Talisalenia Space. I'm Marla Weech. On behalf of the ILS team and our partners and customers worldwide, thank you again for joining us for the 50th ILS Proton launch. We now would like to leave you with one more spectacular look at the liftoff of the Proton rocket with the W2A satellite on board.